Right. Hello, everybody. Hi, Chef Michael Smith here, live from Prince Edward Island. Forgive us if we are a few minutes late. We had to run over to the bridge there, get the cable plug in, hooked up to the mainland. I think we're I think we're nice and tight now, though. And uh, welcome to my test kitchen here on Prince Edward Island. On the on behalf of the Avion Collection, it's awesome to be here again with you tonight. I really enjoyed uh, getting to know you through this uh, this opportunity to share my passion for food and cooking and putting it all together into life lessons. So thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time tonight to join us. And here's how it's going to work tonight. We're going to we're really going to take a bit of a deep dive into the world of bread. I mean, this is one of my all time favorite things to do at home. It's really it just shows so much of what we do when we're at our best for our families, when we take the time to make our own bread. And and I know that, uh, you, you know, there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to understand. So we're going to dive deep into that tonight. That's what it's all about. And and here's how it's going to work. Uh, I, you know, I know you've got your your event guide and uh, we've taken the time to put lots of great resources together for you. And and think of it that way. Don't don't think of it, though, as, uh, as a play by play guide or anything. You don't need to, to follow this. And uh, later it'll be there waiting for you. And, and we're not going to pretend like in 45 minutes, an hour that we're going to cover 100% of the world of bread, every single thing. Let's not try to set the bar that high. Instead, what I want to do with you is just the obvious. I want to take a loaf of bread from start to finish, just show you every step of the way, and maybe even figure out what I think the secret ingredient is. And I do think there's a secret ingredient to great bread making. You're going to need a recipe, of course. You know, and uh, there really isn't a good way to make bread without a good, strong, solid recipe ratio. And so once you've got that ratio in hand and that basic understanding of how it all fits together, you're off for an infinite, you know, a lifetime of great bread making. And that's, that's really what we're here tonight to do is just explore that, that basic method and what it stands for, how it all comes together and how it works. So uh, before we get started, though, uh, yeah, I guess I want to challenge myself a little bit. And I want to challenge you too. Bread is not incidental. Bread is magic. You think about what we can do with four simple ingredients and a fifth secret one and create loaves of bread. It's amazing. And it, it is something to be honored. It is special. And I'd really love for you to try one at home. And so I'm going to challenge you and myself. So think of it this way. If I, if I can do this, right here in front of you live in 60 seconds flat, because I know so much of what stops us from making great bread. The big one is, is sort of all that kneading, right? All that kneading of all that dough, all that work, all that effort, you know, those big beefy forearms that you're pulling that off. I mean, I own giant industrial machinery for that step. I get it. It can be an impediment, that idea that you just, you got to work so hard to pull together a loaf of bread. So here's my challenge. If I can do this in 60 seconds flat, if I can literally do it without cutting, no trickery, it ain't Food Network tonight, you know, for real, right here, get your own timer going. If I can make a dough, the dough, a perfectly good real dough ready to be made, into, if I can do that in 60 seconds flat, will you take a shot? Will you do it? Will you give it a whirl later on when you get a shot? Will you? Awesome. Let's do this, Okay. Honestly, that kind of felt a little bit like Dora the Explorer, but we're over it now. So let's make some bread. Let's see if I can do this in 60 seconds flat. And if I can, I know you can too. I absolutely know you can. So, hey, we even got a timer, all right? So in 60 seconds, I am going to try to pull together this dough, all right? Here we go. 60 seconds. Can he do it? And we're off with one minute to go. First, I need my flour and I need four cups. And there's one and there's two and there's three. And I'm, of course, using all-purpose flour, there's, there's my flour, and I'm going to need a little bit of, uh, of yeast, of course, here we go, going to need some salt, not quite two teaspoons, about a teaspoon of yeast, and I need to evenly distribute those finer powders amidst those coarser ones, of course I do, and I'm going to need some water to hydrate at about 43% hydration, I like 43%, it's easy to stir 43% together, which is exactly what I'm doing right now, avoiding all of that crazy effort that it takes to make that dough, all of that kneading, all of that effort with eight, seven, six, five, four. 
And done. Did I pull it off? Look at that. You can see what I did right there. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a little bit messy, but I've proven my point. You can stir together dough that quickly. You can do it. You can stir it together. You can just combine super simple ingredients and do this. Let's turn this guy off and let's dive a little deeper, okay? Just trying to have a little fun. It's a fun trick when you can make this stuff in 60 seconds flat. And then, but obviously there's a bit of a trade off here because what I've just revealed to you is the secret ingredient. Flour, water, salt, and yeast, very obvious. Those are the four basic. And that's what's so magical is that those, those super simple ingredients can do this incredibly complex thing and combine and rise and turn into bread in the first place. The fifth ingredient though is time. Whether it's fast or slow, time and understanding time and understanding time's relationship to bread making, that is the secret. Simply put, the longer the bread stays alive, the better it tastes. We're not going to get too deep in the sourdough and the like tonight, but for the moment, the corollary here, being able to stir this together so quickly with such a high amount of water that it just stirs quickly, the corollary is that this now needs to rest needs to sit overnight. It needs to be patient at this point. And that's exactly what's going to happen to it. That guy's off for the night. Instead, let's make a new one though. And let's take our time this time. So you can really start to understand all of these ingredients without a 60 second rush. So let's move on to the base recipe that you have. And I'm going to use my, uh, I'm going to use my, my flashcards tonight. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is just explore ingredients. The five basic ingredients. Let's 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 dive deep into that as we pull this together. So, of course, we know that flour is the first one, and and in your basic uh, in your basic recipe, we're uh, we're calling for three cups of white flour. Now you've got some choices, and let's let's take a quick look at how this all fits together and how this all works. And maybe maybe the best way to understand it is to just quickly look at what a grain is in the first place. You know, one of the best parts about grain is that Canada grows the world's grain. Like we, we grow the world's best grain right here in Canada. We produce all kinds of different grains for all kinds of different bread making, but they all have the same basic three parts. Every whole grain is protected. It's a seed, remember, and it's protected by a tough outer fibrous coating. And that's of course the bran. We've all heard of it, wheat bran. It's a great thing to put in the cereals, additive, et cetera, wheat bran. And then you've got wheat germ, and it's a tiny little bit of, of the whole wheat seed is the germ, tiny little bit. It's got oil in it. The oil is what can make all this go rancid and all that, but in there is all that secret for life, all that smart stuff, all that DNA is just sitting there in that germ, ready to rip, ready to turn into a new plant. And the energy it needs, it's protected by that brand, but its energy is sitting here in the endosperm. And it's the endosperm that turns into flour. That's the carbs, that's the crazy, that's where the magic is, that's where the gluten is, right there in the endosperm. So keep in mind those three basic parts, that's a whole grain. So how does that then relate to flour? Well, when you dive right into the middle and you take that endosperm out and you get rid of the bran and you get rid of the germ, you now have white flour. Whole wheat flour is when you keep the bran, you keep the germ. It's still in the flour. White flour, it's gone. There's still a spectrum there, though, and you can see it here. So we still have, on one end of the spectrum, pastry flour. Very tender flour. It's wheat flour. It doesn't have very much gluten. This flour is used for tender cookies, tender pancakes, that sort of thing. As you cross the spectrum to the other end, we have bread flour. Bread flour has the highest gluten content, the most strength, makes the best, strongest bread that lifts the highest. This is a very particular type of grain, often grown in Canada, with just a very high protein concentrate in it that makes just good bread, high gluten. In the center is what we know as all-purpose flour, all-purpose, optimized for bread, optimized for tender, for cookies too. That's why it's called all-purpose little bit less protein, a little bit less gluten content than the bread stuff, but all purpose. It's wonderful. It works. I use it all the time more than anything else. 
here's some whole wheat flour. And there's lots of different types of whole wheat. I actually have some red fife whole wheat flour here as well. Red fife, the grain that made Canada great. One of the original grains that we planted as settlers when we broke the sod for the first time crossing the prairies. Whole wheat flour, you've seen it, you know what it looks like. What, what gives it that characteristic look is the presence of the bran and the germ. It's still there in the flour. So that's kind of the spectrum. And so how does this relate to gluten? And what's this gluten thing in the first place? Well, Gluten is the magical ingredient that's present in that protein that allows bread to form a matrix, an elastic web, this crazy balloon, think of it as, and it blows up, and it's the gluten that gives it all that elastic strength. And gluten's present in the endosperm and the white part, so the stronger the flour, the more the gluten. That's what makes it strong bread flour, higher gluten percentage. So when we're mixing that base recipe together, Start with white flour, three cups, okay? Think of that as your base, and <laughs> don't obsess uh, measuring-wise. You know, you know I, I mean, take your time. You don't have to be all finicky about this. Do your best to get these perfect cups, though. There's one, two, all-purpose flour, forever going through this stuff in my house. Two, and three. So this is kind of the base flour for the recipe, three. Now the options start to kick in. This is where it really gets fun. The basic recipe is easy to understand. The next step is whole wheat flour. Now I'm going to add one cup of whole wheat. I mean, how do you keep track of all that? Well, for the moment, let's just understand that all those grains that you right, the, the visible grains that makes it taste and look so good, those visible grains to bakers are dough garnish. So we've reserved a cup at the end here for dough garnish. And you've got lots of options, lots and lots of options. Okay. Um, and for this particular recipe, we're going to use oats. Okay. We doing good, guys? Here we go. So oats is the, uh, the dough garnish, as it were. So I'm just going to add a cup of oats. So now these are steel cut oats, rolled oats. They could be any oats. And they could be many other things, too. They could be simple things like cornmeal, for instance. Cornmeal, a cup of that and bread makes wonderful bread. Cornmeal bread, wonderful bread. Um, it could be things like, actually, it could be uh, a 12 grain mix. You've seen this sort of thing, okay? These are those mixes that you can see at the supermarket. There are lots of different types available. Sometimes in the breakfast cereal mix, maybe a way to make porridge or the like. I see some flax in there, different types of grain. Uh, all those different grain mixtures, all fair game at this point. 
Um, here's one, a little bit out in left field, but boy, it makes good bread, believe it or not. A cup of potato flakes for that dough garnish. A cup of potato flakes could be really something. Potato flakes are sweet, they're, they're made naturally. It's all good, it's a great way to stir some interesting flavor into a bread. Another one of my favorites, Red River cereal. Lots of us love the flax in Red River cereal and flax grain is such a nice dough garnish for bread. So just think of that last cup as, as room to play, a place to try different things. Today we're going with the oats, constant steady one in my house, makes great bread, but again, for you it could be different things. Constant as well, yeast. Let's take a closer look at yeast. No doubt you've noticed when you go to the supermarket, there are so many different types of yeast. It can be so confusing. And I'm here to tell you they're basically all the same. Don't sweat it, just get yeast and measure yourself out a heaping teaspoonful, as much as you can get on that spoon, all right? There it is, heaping teaspoon of any yeast, any yeast, instant yeast, fast yeast, bread machine yeast, pizza yeast, this yeast, that yeast, or the other yeast, they're all the same darn yeast, don't sweat it, one teaspoon. The great equalizer here, again, we come back to time. Because some of you are bread bakers and you've had a chance to make bread before, and you've maybe noticed that there's less yeast in this recipe, in this ratio, than other breads. And again, it's about time. Many, many breads are made to be pulled together in an afternoon, ready for dinner in just a couple of hours. I understand the need for that. And so those breads need to be sped up. And that just means they have to have a lot of yeast. In them. They just got to blow up fast. And the flavors are OK, but they're not as good as when you let the bread live a little longer, maybe even overnight. So yeast, you know, that's what the yeast is. Now sourdough, that's a whole other start, a whole other thing. We'll get to that another day. But for now, don't sweat your yeast. Just get yeast, keep it in your refrigerator, use a heaping teaspoon, and then on to the salt. Okay. And I'm gonna use about two teaspoons of salt, quite the full tablespoon, and it goes. Salt's essential. Bread without salt just tastes so bland, just essential. And so now, as a tool, I switch to my whisk. Okay, because you've got all these finer powders, as I said earlier, that need to be evenly distributed. And you need to take a moment right now, um, get that yeast mixed in, get those oats mixed in, get that salt mixed in. Okay, take a moment, use your whisk, great tool for this. This is about as much mixing as you're gonna have to do. It's so simple, okay? So at this point, just to review, we've worked our way through the first base ingredient, all the flour, our second two ingredients, the, the yeast, the third, the salt. Moving on to the fourth though, the water. Let's head this way. Okay, oh, I gotta get my, my cards. All right, this feels like, I can't remember if this feels like me in the back of the classroom or in the front of the classroom. Five ingredients, so let's keep that in mind, time. Next thing we're gonna do is work on forming the dough, the obvious next step. So we're, right now to form that dough, that one ingredient, the water is missing. So key point here, take the time to make sure your water is room temperature to warm. Certainly not cold, certainly not hot. And here's why. It's important to understand, it's really important to understand that the yeast is very much alive, very much alive. And so we want to keep it alive. It's the key. Bread doesn't work with dead yeast. So warm water it feels warm to the touch is the sort of temperature that yeast likes. Okay, taking that moment's key detail. Okay, so there's my water just sitting on top, no big deal. Now I can, I can geek out a little bit here and I can tell you that when you do the math, and I'm at about a 43% hydration ratio here by weight. Um, and that just means that that's the highest possible amount of water that can be added to a dough and still function as a dough. Any further it starts to turn into batter and it just won't rise. Any less, any less water, it's just really hard to work together. So this bread and this method is known as no knead bread. This comes from a long tradition of, of high hydration doughs. 
um, insight that bakers all over the word, world have learned for themselves, that when there's lots of water in the bread, you get great results. You can't go too far, though, of course, too far. But it, And it's harder to work with the dough when it's soupy, of course. So what's nice about this, though, is as I did earlier, at this point, all I'm doing is stirring it together. You can see the magic with your own eyes. Okay, this is such a game changer when you know that this is how your bread is going to work, that you're not going to have to laboriously spend all this time folding it median or using a machine or anything of the sort. Okay, so I'm just stirring it together, making sure it's gathered up, making sure all that moisture has a chance, taking my time. Okay, this isn't a time to rush. Certainly not to do a 60 second challenge, but it comes together quickly. The numbers work and you can see what's starting to happen. It's just gathering up. And what part of bread making is just learning to be present. And if you find somehow all of a sudden that, you know, you can't quite get that last little bit of flour to come out at the bottom, it's no big deal. You can just add a little splash of water to pull it together or just keep going. Okay. You can knead a little bit. Kneading, of course, is just the the folding of it's not even folding. I mean, look what I'm doing. I'm just trying to gather up that last, you can see it. I still have this little bit of flour. Okay, this is happens. This happens a lot. So, really, all you have to do is just sort of pick this up a few times. Just expose the, the wet part of the dough to the bowl. Okay, you're just trying to gather up the ingredients. This is not kneading. This is just gathering of ingredients. Okay, and, and I've succeeded. That's what you're looking for. Let's take a look at that for a second while I wash my hands off. But you can see what's going on there. There's a, a beautiful ball of dough. It forms together. It's obviously got lots of great garnish in it. It's looking like it's going to taste amazing. Um, but it's, it, 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 of course, now needs time. Let's talk about that. So what we've successfully done here at this point is form the dough. Okay, form the dough, we've got that, we're doing good. And now it's time for first rise, first rise. And what is this rise business? This is when the magic really starts to happen, this first rise. Because I said it earlier, I want you to think of this as a balloon. This is a balloon, and it's a lot. And the yeast is going to blow up that balloon. The yeast is in the midst of that dough. It's got lots of food. It's got all those carbohydrates from the flour. And it's going to eat that, eat the sugars, and it's going to, going to excrete gas. And that gas is going to blow up the balloon. And the balloon is the intricate web that the gluten makes for us. So this is the best way to think of it is we've got to blow up a balloon. And it hasn't happened yet, but we've done everything right. Having said that, take a closer look. The dough itself, I mean, you can see it's sort of a little elastic. But look, it's still crumbly, too. All right, it's not like it's like the best damn dough going. Look at that. You shouldn't be able to do that to dough. Okay, so what's my point? Well, we're still missing that one ingredient, and it's time. We can mix this together quickly, stir it together, but it, now it needs to sit, best case scenario, overnight. Chip, typically in my family, we make right after dinner. We let it sit overnight. In the morning, we bake. It needs to sit overnight. Because it turns out that kneading, that action, that work, that motion, that turning of the dough, that stretching of the gluten, that working of the gluten, that developing of the gluten, that lengthening of the gluten, it, it turns out that all that mechanical process is a shortcut. That when you simply combine flour and water and time, gluten naturally forms all by itself. That's the magic. Let me show you what I mean. So this guy now has to rest overnight. Tomorrow, it's going to look like this. And look at the difference. It's insane. You can see it. Look how much it has expanded. This is alive. It has filled the bowl. You can see you can see the bubbles, and as I break it down, you can see the gluten. You can see what's happening because the first rise is behind us, and now it's time for the knockdown and the lump off. 
So here we go. Let's knock down and low form and watch what happens. You can see with your own eyes. Remember, this was not kneaded in a machine. It was stirred together more like pancake batter. And 12 hours later, look at the gluten. Just look at it. Look at how elastic that is. I didn't do that. Mother Nature did that. Working with Father Time, will you look at that? I find it so magical. And I can smell it. Oh my God, it smells so alive. You can just smell the yeast. It's had the time. We gave it the time. We let it sit all night. It takes on this fruity aroma. This is what makes bread taste good. Giving it time, not rushing it, letting it sit, letting it develop flavor. This is going to be the good stuff. So now, of course, I've got to get this wet, soupy mess out of that bowl, and i got to get it into a loaf pan. Pretty straight ahead. So, you know, on the some flour, you know, on the work surface, get your hands floured up a bit, and the dough comes out. It's a bit wet, of course. You can see that. And I'm just going to sprinkle some more flour. And all I'm trying to do is just make this workable, okay, so it's not sticking to my fingers. Because what I need to do is just quickly roll it a little bit to form the actual dough. And what I want to do is form a dough with a nice, smooth, tight surface. I want to tighten this dough up as much as I possibly can. It's really tricky. I have to counter-revolutionize the dough. I'm going to rotate it one way and the other way at the same time. And it's hard to explain. And I'm going to dig my hands under. And, and it's the sort of skill you've just got to do it a few times. You watch me do it. But for you to learn, you're just going to have to do it yourself. Let's give it a shot, though. So this really all I'm trying to do is not all this flour. What I want to do is just form this into a smooth dough. So at first, look, as I push it, it just moves back and forth. See? Like, it's not doing anything, is it? I'm just pushing it. I have to somehow get it to dig in. And that's where I start to, I'm going to start to attack the side at an angle. I'm going to push under, okay? And not only that, the dough is going to move in a circle this direction, but at the same time, I'm going to spin it against that rotation, okay? It's moving in two different circles, and that's what's going to make it tight. Here I go. Hard to see. This is where we would cut to the slow mo cam in the, in the cut. I can tell when it starts to grab and when it does, I'll tell you. I can feel it, here it goes. You can see the flowers starting to disappear. Okay, so it's not stick there. See how it's starting to stick a bit? That allows it to grab, that allows me to, to form it. See the difference? It's forming now. Okay, maybe it's a little too sticky. Just flower up again. Real quick, no big deal. Okay, once you get the hang of this, easy to practice too. Same loaf. Just keep going until it feels good and tight. There we go. Look at the difference. Okay, nice and tight and alive. Into the loaf pan it goes. Okay, and now maybe a bit of a paradox because now it's time for that second rise. And why? Why do we always go to a second rise? You know, when I get into talking about bread, we get deep into the details. Um, you know, this is one of the biggest questions. Like, why do we take the time to rise it again? Like, why does bread tell you to mix the dough, let it rise, and then knock it down? They rise a second time. What's going on? Why not just mix it the first time, throw it in the low pan, when it rises, throw it in the oven? What's up? The short answer is that by letting it rise the second time, you keep the dough alive longer. And the longer the dough is alive, the better it tastes. So what's going to happen here is that because I knocked it down, it rose all night, I knocked that bread back down, I deflated that balloon, the gluten is developed, it's ready to blow up again, the yeast very much alive, multiple generations later, like the yeast is very much alive, and I've just given it a whole new food source. I'm putting it back close to the food. So now it can start eating again and start rising again. And you get more flavor out of it that way. You get a better looking loaf that way as well. So what's it going to look like next? Well, now we let it rise for about two hours or so. And this is one of those times when you have to trust yourself more than the clock. 
Because this is when the recipe will often say, hey, just let it double, let it rise, let it lift. You want to see that it's alive, that it's that it's there, that things are happening in that dough. And you know, maybe the clock isn't the best way to do it. Your own observation, of course, is the way to do it. And this is what it's going to look like. Here we go. This is all the exact same dough, step by step. There's what it looks like next. Now, this has risen a lot. Honestly, we put this, uh, we put this on maybe a little too soon a couple hours ago. You can see it's risen so much that it's kind of starting to come over the pan. Okay, now look, is that a fail? No, that's just life. That's okay. Really what that is is evidence of, of, of real because if you're going to take the time to make a loaf of bread, all of this work that we're going through, don't you want a big loaf of bread, a big one? That's what you see right there. So other things to see. At one little point I forgot to, to point out. This one's important. After this dough is formed and in this pan, take a second, spray it with a little spray oil, just the surface. Okay, so what did I just do? What I'm trying to do is keep that surface as supple as I can. I don't want it to dry out. If it dries out, it prevents the natural action of the yeast within the dough from doing its thing. It's like you prevent it from rising. We don't want that to happen. So we keep it moist by just lightly spraying it with oil. And it delivered. It absolutely helped right here. That helped a lot. You can see that this was free to rise and expand. We want the same thing to happen again. So not a bad idea to just spray it one more time. You'll get, uh, you'll get a touch more brownie out of it as it bakes because we're heading now into the bake. When you bake, there's even more steps here to think about. So let's take this now straight to the oven and think about what's gonna happen in the oven. There we go. Now that oven is at 425 degrees. It's the highest temperature I can get out of that oven. And I've got my convection fan on. So I'm moving the air around inside the oven, making it more efficient. It's going to help that bread rise. Now, the first few minutes when the bread goes into the oven are critical because during these first few minutes, you get what's known as the oven spring. The oven spring is when you sort of activate the yeast, almost like you make it angry. Yeah, yeah, just put it at a 425 degree. It's very much alive. It's in that hot oven. It gets angry. It has one last sort of jam and it poofs a little bit more. You get what's called the oven spring. And the best way to maximize that oven spring, to get the most of it, is to, again, make sure the surface of the bread is supple, that it hasn't dried out. And that's where we start to get into things like adding water to the oven, doing things like, and there's lots of techniques. Chefs like me, we spend tens of thousands of dollars on very expensive ovens that inject steam into the oven cavity. That's how it's done at the industrial level. In our restaurant, we would oven bake. We don't inject steam into that. Often recipes call for ice cubes in the bottom of the oven or spraying water on the surface of the bread instead of oil. Those are the two best options, the oil or just spraying a little bit of water on the surface before you bake it. Ice cubes on the bottom, spending $10,000 on a fancy oven that injects steam once a month, if you're lucky, yeah, just spray it a little bit, okay? But most importantly, understand why you're doing that. And it is to keep the surface of the bread from drying out just in those critical first few minutes as it bakes. Because while we're talking about this oven spring business, it's happening over there right now. It's only in the first few minutes. The other thing, of course, is the high heat. We want that explosive heat pounding right to the center of the bread. And we're going to bake that bread for about 50 minutes or so. That's about what it takes. And let's see what it looks like because I got my fancy food network oven. So here we go. This is what it's going to look like. Okay, we, we had a chance to make a lot of bread to pull, this, pull all this off today. And I think we ended up making nine loaves of bread to, to do all of this. And and, and that's so much fun. There's gonna be so much bread left over. Um, this guy right here though, once again, is the same exact base recipe that you folks have at home. Uh, and this is what it looks like. 
after it cools down. Um, this loaf did have a chance to cool down. And to me, so, you know, okay, whatever. It's a little blown out on the side. I don't care. I'm making bread, you know, with my kids at home. Um, what do I care? And I, what I'm proud of is that they'll all come running right now. Everybody wants that heel piece. Everybody knows, you know, this, that's the tastiest piece right there. <laughs> and let's look a little closer. So I'm cutting into her and, and see for yourself. Let's take a closer look at what that bread looks like. You can see it's great bread. It's got great crumb right there. Nice texture to it. Beautiful bread. Oatmeal in there. Bit of whole wheat flour. Lots going on in this bread. Um, um, and when we go back to thinking about the, the variations, here's some of the other breads that you can do. Take a look here. So um, this guy right here is... Uh, this guy right here is potato bread. Let's look at this, shall we? Yeah, we'll just put this one here. That's the regular. Here's potato bread, okay? So this one, this one really hydrated. The potato flakes really absorb the water. Um, and you end up with a very interesting sweet flavor. Great bread for toast. This one's got potatoes in it. That last cup of dough garnish was, was actually potato. And look, look there, you can see again, it's so open, the grain, the crumb, just a nice bread. Um, this guy right here, 12 grain bread. Okay, so this was using one of those sort of fancy grain garnishes or, or porridges. They're often meant to be used for porridge at breakfast, good cane, winter breakfast. And uh, that 12 grain, look what it yielded. That one's looking like my favorite so far. Great looking bread. So much going on. Look at the surface of it, all that texture, all that flavor. I really tend to think of this as country bread, making bread this way. Nice big loaves, lots of grain, lots of flavor, oatmeal, things like that. And, you know, and really, I tend to think of city bread, the corollary, country bread, city bread. The first loaf of bread we saw tonight, city bread made with just white flour, city bread. Also great bread. You know, this, I got to admit, my kids... Sometimes like the city bread a lot more than all the other breads because look at this. It's straight up white bread. It makes great sandwiches, great toast, great French toast on the weekend. I mean, come on, what kid doesn't want that? And frankly, dad, the baker over here, I don't really care. You know, what, I, what, what I'm sort of jazzed about is that the kids are eating real bread and often making it themselves. So I can uh, quibble too much at that point. So lots to absorb, eh? We just worked our way through all these cards. Let me right back and absorb this for a second. Look at all these steps. What bread is all about? Simple ingredients, flour, water, salt, yeast, and that magical fifth one, time. Understanding that time is such a huge part of bread making in my restaurant. And someday we'll, we'll, do, we'll do a little show about this. We, we naturally ferment our bread. We don't use yeast out of a little bottle. We use a sourdough starter. It's been alive for years. It's a whole other art form. It's been alive for years, though. It's no wonder that that bread tastes so amazing. Time. Figuring out how to bring time into your bread making is the way to level it up. Five simple ingredients. Learning how to form that dough. Learning how to use the high ratio water. Thanks to Sullivan Street Bakery and Dan Levy all those years ago, uh, Dan, uh, all, they're helping us all sort of get onto the, uh, onto the no need baking express. It's been my baking style for 20 years, lots and lots of water. It's just easy to do. Forming the dough, knocking it down, understanding why it rises and how to bake it, turning it on, all of it. At the end of the day, the best way to learn though is to simply do it, to jump in there and give it a whirl. You can do this, it's not complicated. It's just making bread. So I know, uh, wow, it's, uh, <laughs> let me sit right here. Um, it's, a, it's so cool for Avion and all you folks to be able to take the time to dive into this stuff and, and see what we can learn together. You know, like any good teacher, I learned from from teaching too. And it's always fun to dive in and share this time together. I really am thankful for this. I'm thankful that all you folks are here tonight. And, and thanks for the Avion collection for, for bringing this together to my own test kitchen, in my own backyard. Um, I do want to first announce our uh, cookbook winners, shall we? 
Um, we've got 10 tonight uh, that want, have won cookbooks. They're personally signed by a very tall chef. And uh, we've got copies of Farm, Fire, and Feast to give away. That's my latest. Um, this is what it looks like right here, Farm, Fire, and Feast. And would you believe two days ago I hit send and I just hit number uh, 12. I just sent off to my publisher. But for now, this is the one wonderful book. And uh, here's who's taking one home tonight, Tuba. UMAC, Tuba UMAC, uh, Jeff Skinner, Carla Swansburg, um, Andrew Maiboom, um, Jundit Eugenia, Jennifer Ash, Jux May, Jillian Burgeon, uh, Mark Ripley, and Eddie Kyung. All are, will be receiving cookbooks. Thank you. Um, as well, uh, let's do a little bit of QA, shall we? I think I've got some. Quick questions right here. Uh, I know we weren't able to sort of cover every single thing, but a little bit of Q and A. Uh, okay, so looking at um, first, what kind what kind of things can we also can we incorporate into the dough beyond just like the the the, uh, the grains and stuff? And so it's a question about onions, bell pepper, etc. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, you really what you have to do is think about the ingredients you're going to add to the dough in terms of what do they do in the dough? Do they support their own weight in the dough? Do they Take water, oh, do they add water to the dough? So things like, say, chopped up sautéed onions, garlic, bell peppers, um, lightly activated, touch of sautéing, and then stir it into the dough? Absolutely. Work within that one cup ratio left there for you to play with, that, that one cup of dough garnish. That's for you to play with. That's where you would incorporate your bell peppers, your onions, things like that. Um, and heading sort of towards a little maybe focaccia territory. Um, can you use this recipe for pizza dough? Not my favorite go-to recipe for pizza dough. Um, I, yes, you can. You can work with it. You can add flour. You can roll it. Um, uh, maybe add a touch more water. You can optimize it. Yes, you can. But, uh, but out of the gate, it's a little bit too wet for good pizza dough. Pizza dough works best when it's made with strong bread flour, not a whole lot of whole wheat going on in a good pizza dough. You need the very, very strongest possible dough that's not so wet that it sticks to everything getting in and out of the oven. So this dough wouldn't be my first choice. I would be more apt to adapt it to a pizza dough. Um, how, here's a question about sugar. If you're adding sugar to your dough, it's because it's an old fashioned dough. It's not necessary. It's one of those doughs where we're trying to make the bread too fast. So you go look at commercial bread, you go look at the, oh, it's a wonderful name. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's uh, it's made within hours. Folks, you know this, uh, like, come on, that bread's made within just a couple of hours. It includes a lot of sugar and industrial processes and additives that speed that yeast up so much. Generally, sugar in the recipe is, is just code for we're trying to speed up the yeast. We're trying to give it Super easy food to just get it jacked, get it rolling, let's make this bread fast. Sugar is not generally considered a valid bread ingredient. It is not one of the five. It's just not on the list. It really shouldn't be in your bread. Um, that's just me. I'm not throwing shade on all the old recipes out there that include a little sugar. I'm just explaining to you why they include the sugar. Those are recipes that are meant to be fast. You need sugar to get that, that yeast jacked up. Um, how do you double the recipe? Yeah, do you double the yeast? Um, yes, absolutely. If you're going to double the recipe, double everything. But my suggestion is don't double the recipe. Follow me here. Don't double the recipe. Instead, make the recipe twice. When we start to double recipes in the world of baking and pastry, we can get into trouble. There are unintended consequences. So better to just make the bread twice. Just make a loaf then make another. But don't try to make an extra big loaf. You could get into trouble there. I'd say make two small. Well, these are not small loaves. These are nice big loaves. Um, and what is my absolute favorite type of bread? Well, for me, it, it really is a bread that maximizes the, the, all of the all of the sort of things that go into bread. And there's there's three. And the, of course, the ingredients. So our bread at the Anna Bay Fortune, for instance, all the, the ingredients are from Prince Edward Island. We use exclusively flowers grown on Prince Edward Island. We use red white and Acadian grains grown on Prince Edward Island, local grains. Secondly, the bread needs to be naturally fermented. The very best bread is naturally fermented. We're using yeast 
perfectly valid. Please do. It's it's real. It's alive. It's a great way to make yeast, to make bread. Lots of us, though, like naturally fermented bread. There's lots of ways to get there. One of them is what we start to call sourdough starters and the like. There's other things you can do. But in general, we're talking about naturally fermented bread. The third big one for me is wood oven baked. So local ingredients naturally fermented and then baked in our wood oven. That's how we make bread at the end. That's my favorite way of bread. And I would never do that at home. I'm, <laughs> that's crazy. It's tough doing that stuff. Like our baker, Kenya, who someday we'll, 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 we'll get to meet, we'll do a show about how we make sourdough bread at the end. Unbelievably talented, like bread whisper, the bomb that it takes to get in there and understand that stuff is, is off the hook and far beyond even what I cook at home. I don't cook that way at home. It's enough to make just good real bread like this at home. Um, and I'm not saying don't master sourdough. I'm just saying be prepared because it's a big one. Um, how are we doing for time? We're, um, we're doing well. A um, couple things I want to um, throw to, things I want to clue in. Um, we're looking forward to uh, quite a few things downstream soon. We're going to be in uh, Lake Louise on April 1st, going to be there with my team. Uh, my very first trip, I haven't been on a plane since all this nonsense started two years ago. My last trip was to St. John's, Newfoundland to cook with my good friend Todd Perrin at Mallard Cottage, and I haven't been on a plane since. And Really looking forward to getting back on a plane, flying out west to land in Calgary and heading up in the mountains to uh, to cook up on the hill there in Lake Louise. We're going to have a grand day on April 1st up on the uh, up on the hill there. Uh, and then we're coming to Ontario later in April, 22-23, uh, some events, lots of details coming out soon. We're going with Quailsgate Winery and uh, Two Sisters. Looking forward to getting down to Niagara to Two Sisters. So lots of fun stuff there. And We'll have a new uh, website up soon. We're developing all kinds of great recipe content. Uh, lots of you have seen them. We're doing these live shows together, but we're also doing some great old school recipe content. Share with you with lots of the recipes that, that I actually cook at home. You know, my food lifestyle now for, for my kids. And for instance, this week, and just uh, I think Friday, we're going to shoot uh, our next recipe video, just the art and craft of how to properly pan fry whitefish. Uh, gosh, like, there's nothing better. We're going to do that one next. Um, and the portal's coming that's going to hold all this stuff, put it all in one place so you can go and access all these recipes and videos. And we're building a resource that you will have exclusive access to, that you will be able to use as a resource in your kitchen as you cook for your friends and family. And I'm really thrilled about that. Honestly, this is super cool. Avion Collection, we're killing it. We're, this is a great thing to be doing. Um, building more and more content too over time. And then um, in May, we'll be doing next month, or in May, I guess we're in March now, we'll skip it April, but in May, we're gonna do another live event similar to this here in the test kitchen. Haven't figured out what that one's gonna be about yet though. So lots more ahead of us, including um, a video, a video. We're gonna here in a moment throw to a video. I want you to watch this super fun one that we did lately. This is um, up ahead of us, it's a good oven. Um, and all the things that, uh, that I cook in my own home, you know, one end of my, my home across from the kitchen in the house is a wood oven. I built my house 15 years ago and put a wood, uh, wood oven in at the last minute thinking, I'm going to learn how to use this thing. And, and I did. I did. I'm so glad I made that choice 20. It's almost 20 years now. And really all of that energy, all that spirit, all those things I've learned in my own home right over there, uh, that wood oven. Well, really, it gave me all that spirit and energy that led in so many ways to the fireworks. at the And so that video is is coming up straight ahead. Before we go there, though, let me just one more time say thank you. It's uh, it's so awesome to get together and share this time with you and everybody across Canada and around the world. And, and once again, my thanks to the Avion Collection for bringing us together. There's so much more ahead of us. I look forward to sharing lots of exclusive content here from my test kitchen and seeing lots of you folks out on the road. I can't wait to shake your hand and cook for you. I think we're all looking forward to that. So for now, signing off from Prince Edward Island, Chef Michael Smith. Enjoy this video now about my wood oven, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, thanks, just thanks so much for spending time with me tonight. All the best, folks. Cheers. Hi, I'm Chef Michael Smith, thrilled to be sharing exclusive stories and flavors with the Avion Collection. Welcome to Prince Edward Island and welcome to the 
fireworks, our wood-fired cooking collection at the Inn at Bay Fortune. And it all began right here with my home hearth and my home wood oven. 20 years ago, I decided my new home needed a wood oven, even though I had no sweet clue how to use one. But once I got the hang of it, that bumpy road gave me the strength and the confidence, and most importantly, the flavors to go all in at the end with every form of fire known to man. Uniquely, the chimney for a wood oven is actually at the front of the oven. It's not inside with the flame. So the oxygen that that fire needs has to travel here through the bottom of this opening and the smoke, the exhaust, actually comes out of the same exact opening. It's a little tricky, but once you get the hang of it, you realize that just like any fire, you can control this one by controlling its oxygen. And that right there is how you turn down a wood oven. At first, this was just a pizza oven, and that's still a big part of our family's tradition. I bring it online every New Year's Eve for our annual New Year's Eve pizza party, and then we keep it burning all winter long. Here on the hearth, I can cook minutes after I light a fire. It's ready to go. But the wood oven takes days and days and days just to warm up for the first cook. And that's because of the thermal mass. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of sand above the oven. And that's the genius. Once that sand warms up, it stays hot. And so we cook with retained heat in the wood oven. You don't actually need a fire in the oven to cook in the oven. And so then, once that's up to speed, it's just a question of maintaining that heat day after day, patiently keeping it going, enjoying all that nice warm heat in our home, and... You know, cooking with it a little bit too. You learn very quickly in a wood oven that it's all about balancing time and temperature. A pizza, for instance, it cooks best in two minutes flat, which means you need 700 degrees of temperature to cook the bottom of the pizza on the floor of the oven and a thousand degrees of flame licking the top of the oven to cook those toppings, to brown that cheese. And it's just as magical in there when it starts to slow down a bit. As the fire dies down to active coals, there's still lots and lots of heat in this oven. It might be lower than pizza heat, but it's still far hotter than a normal home oven. So obviously things cook very quickly, but there's more. Those unmistakable, smoky, woodsy, roasted, toasted, charred flavors that make this kind of cooking so darn addictive. A chicken spatchcocked for maximum tasty surface area, roasted with lemons and garlic, simply served with pan juices. Brussels sprouts that are somehow simultaneously green and deliciously charred cook so quickly they don't have a chance to overcook. Any potato or root vegetable simply roasted comes alive in here too, especially if there's a little bit of bacon fat involved, but that's another story. Wood-fired cooking is about the journey and the destination. I mean, we think nothing of seasoning wood for years and years and then tending a fire for days and days and days just to cook something and enjoy it in moments. It makes perfect sense. It is about the zen of the fire. This is not complicated, and quite the opposite. This is about as simple as any kind of cooking gets. Really what this is, you've got to be present to be your best. And that's the moral of the story. For the Avion Collection, I'm Chef Michael Smith.